Well, I'd like to uh, start by thanking uh, HCL and Vineet. Uh, they've been an awesome partner. They've had a great year. Uh, and I'd like everyone to stand up for a second. We're going to do a Silicon Valley style cheer for our friends at HCL. Oh. Everyone has to stand up. And I'm going to say one, two, three, and I want everyone to say HCL rocks, okay? <laughs> okay, one, two, three. HCL, HCL rocks. rocks! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Vineet promised me that if I gave him a good cheer, he was going to get on stage tonight and do a bhangra for us. He'll so do that anyway. <laughs> he'll do that anyway. He doesn't need much encouragement. Uh, life doesn't always uh, happen on schedule. And uh, I like to say that the 21st century didn't actually start in the year 2000, but it started uh, a few years later, uh, a year and a half ago in the year 2010. Now, the same was true about the 20th century, which in my mind, started in 1908 when the uh, automobile came about, and it became the century of highways and freeways, uh, the century of the auto, the American century, if you will. Uh, similarly, you see a lot of crossover points happening uh, about a year and a half ago. More cell phones than landlines, more laptops than desktops, uh, more girls in college than boys, uh, more uh, farmed fish eaten than, uh, than wild fish, uh, more debit cards than credit cards. Uh, it was also the year that my daughter graduated from high school and joined college, and hers became the first generation that had grown up on the web right from the start. So as you enter this 21st century, uh, what are the forces that are shaping the decade and the century? I believe there's five forces uh, that will shape the future. The first is the explosion of data. Uh, if you look at the amount of data that has been created from the beginning of mankind till uh, a couple of years ago, and you call that X, then in the last couple of years, there's been 10x that data created. So we're seeing a explosion in the amount of data out there. If you look at all the movies that were created by the movie industry, they are less than what will go up on YouTube just today. Uh, the second factor is the emergence of mobility. It took 100 years for there to be a billion mobile, uh, a billion landlines, and it's going to take just 10 years uh, for there to be uh, a billion uh, cell phones. Uh, the third is the emergence of Asia. A few a hundred years ago, China and India were about two-thirds of the world economy, uh, and most people feel that at some point in the century, we'll revert uh, to that uh, state. Uh, the fourth factor is the emergence of platforms. Platforms like uh, the iPhone App Store, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, it no longer is the case that you have to be a gigantic corporation to reach millions or hundreds of millions of people uh, through platforms, any individual uh, can, can achieve that. Uh, and the final factor is uh, what I call math trumping science. The 20th century was the century of science, and I believe the 21st century will be the si century of, of math. And what I mean by this is that you no longer need to know the why of something. You simply have to know the what. If A and B happen, then C will happen. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, people finally unraveled the secrets to how the AIDS virus mutated. Now, scientists had tried to do this for a very long time uh, and had not been uh, successful. Uh, and a couple of months ago, they made it into a math problem and put it into something called Foldit. Uh, and within a couple of weeks, gamers uh, had unraveled that mystery. Uh, so given these five factors, uh, what does that mean for the corporation of the 21st century? Now, the corporation itself is a modern concept. In the 10,000 years of uh, human civilization, corporations have only existed for the last couple of hundred years. Uh, so they're really a 20th century creation, uh, and they were created uh, to harness uh, economies of scale uh, to become more efficient. Uh, now, how does that change in the 21st century? I think of the 20th century corporation uh, as a Sousa marching band, where everybody robotically marches uh, to the beat of single drama. Uh, now, to meet the challenges and the opportunities of the 21st century, I believe the future will be more like jazz. So every person will be made to feel like they're doing their own thing. Occasionally, they'll improvise. They'll get feedback from their customers. And the job of the leaders, the job of the people in this room, is to make it all come together uh, like a good jazz conductor and make it all sound uh, like music. So. Let's shift our focus to what this means uh, for technology. Now, 
uh, what I'd like to do is use uh, web terminology, and I'd like to look at where technology was, where it is, and where I believe it's going. Uh, and I'll use an example that we can all relate to, uh, a bank, since Tony's sitting here. Uh, and, but let's take a small bank, a bank with, say, 10 million customers. Uh, now, Enterprise 1.0 was the early 60s. The mainframe was the building block. The software was tied to the hardware. And to serve those 10 million customers, you might have a few thousand branches, so a few thousand touch points. And what you might typically have done back then is every couple of weeks, walked into one of the branches with your paycheck, uh, you wait in line, deposit your paycheck, withdraw some cash, and then 10 or 15 minutes later, walk out. And then overnight or batch, that information would get updated. So that was Enterprise 1.0. Uh, we saw the emergence of Enterprise 2.0 about 25 years ago uh, with the advent of client-server computing. Uh, the database became the building block. The software was now tied to the database. Uh, the information was available everywhere, so millions of touch points. Uh, and the information was continuously available, so it was online. So that's the world that most of us have lived in. We're now entering a very exciting new era, and I call that Enterprise 3.0. So you have the same 10 million customers, but they could now be coming on your premises 10 times a month, where a premise could be one of the cell phones I talked about. It could be an ATM machine. It could be a website. It could be a swipe of a credit card, uh, or could be a branch. So just in this customer context, you have 10 times 10 million, 100 million of these events happening. And sitting at the back of the bank, accumulated over the years, is hundreds of terabytes, maybe petabytes of storage. And what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to look at each one of these 100 million events uniquely, tie it back to that petabyte of storage, and determine at that moment in time what just happened. Was this ATM card used here, and then five minutes later, it's being used in Boston? Maybe it's fraud. Maybe it's the loss of a customer. Maybe it's an upsell, cross-sell opportunity. So we're now entering an era where there's going to be trillions of these events happening. And instead of a database, you're going to have a service bus. And instead of the software being tied to the beta database, the software is going to be completely decoupled. And it's going to be event-driven, as in the information is, is going to come to you. And we're going to have trillions and trillions of these events happening. Now, while the amount of data keeps going up and up and up, the shelf life of that data, the useful life of that data keeps coming down. And the amount of time that you have to actually do something about it is coming down even faster. Now, the database companies will have you believe that the big data problem means big database. And nothing could be further from the truth. The database is like a phone that doesn't ring. When something happens, it goes in there, but nobody else knows it happened. So a little secret coming from Silicon Valley, if you look at the companies of the future, you look at a Facebook and Amazon a Zynga, or you look at the 60 companies that a company like Accel has invested in over the last couple of years. Not a single one of those companies uses an Oracle database. Zero. So we're shifting from a world of a disk drive and a database to a world of a bus and in memory. The stack of the enterprise to era, you are dealing largely with static data. You'll now be dealing with dynamic data. Data at rest versus data in motion. The building block was a database. The building block will be a service bus. The killer app was siloed ERP systems. The killer app won't be an app at all. It'll be an end-to-end -end business process. It'll be software as a self-service, where you can do things yourself. The business insight tool of that era was business intelligence, which was largely a reporting system, where you basically would look at what has happened after the fact. Of the future, it'll be predictive business where you will anticipate what's going to happen before it happens. The development tool of that era was an app server, where you were taking information in and out of databases into web storefronts. And in the future, it'll be an event server, where you're dealing in this world of events. Now, I capture uh, some of these ideas in uh, my new book uh, that uh, I call uh, The Two-Second uh, Advantage. And the premise behind The Two-Second Advantage, and I know that uh, this book was given out at the conference. Uh, and the premise of this is that it's more valuable to have a little bit of the right information just a little bit beforehand than to have all the information in the world six months after. 
After all, what's the point of knowing that you've lost a customer after the customer is gone? What's the point of knowing that fraud has been committed after you've lost the money? What's the point of knowing that there's a power outage when you're already sitting in darkness? Uh, so I believe that in order to address these forces of the future, the corporation looks more like a jazz band, less than like a Sousa marching band, and the technology is going to be one where you're going to have information coming to you rather than you having to ask for the information. Uh, we have some great examples of this in a variety of industries. Uh, and in the book uh, that I wrote, we look at not just companies, but we also look at people. And what we found is that if you look at what makes for success in people, you look at a Wayne Gretzky. He wasn't the most athletic guy. He wasn't the fastest. He wasn't the biggest. He wasn't the strongest. And yet, he was arguably the greatest ice hockey player of all time. And he said his secret was that he went to where the puck was going to be rather than where the puck was. Now, what if we could give that kind of capability to a corporation? Uh, I know that in the earlier panel, uh, there was talk about uh, cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, our platform recently uh, got picked by uh, the NSA, the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, uh, as the cybersecurity platform. And we took this approach of the two-second advantage, where the old approach was to simply try to build a bigger and better lock. But no matter how good the lock you build, somebody will find a way to pick it. And so what we do with this approach with the two-second advantage approach is we look for suspicious activity in the neighborhood. It's like a neighborhood watch. So we monitor events, and we make sense out of those events. And when we see something suspicious, then we shut everything down. This is just how the human brain works. Uh, I know that my friend Malcolm spoke earlier, and he talks about the 10,000 hours. And so you look at a Roger Federer and how he uh, has achieved his greatness. Again, it's the two-second uh, advantage where the 10,000 hours have given him patterns in his brain and given him the muscle memory. And you combine that with real-time events. And so if you're able to look at things as they're happening, you're able to then pull out what that pattern is. And at that instant, you're able to make the exact right decision. Now, for those of you who actually uh, make it through my book, uh, one of the examples that we give is of uh, a guy called Mystery. Now, Mystery uh, is the self-professed world's greatest pickup artist. Yeah, world's greatest pickup artist. And so what can you guys, what can a bank, a phone company, a retailer, an airline learn from Mystery? Well, obviously, Mystery is a smart guy. He's uh, figured out one of the mysteries of the universe, the workings of the female brain. Uh, but if you think about what mystery actually does, he's able to say the exact right thing to a woman at the exact right time. Now, what if a company could do that? What if a company could make the exact right offer to their customers at the exact right time or anticipate what's going to happen to prevent a power outage or to prevent fraud or to prevent a cybersecurity hack? What if a corporation could achieve what mystery has? I call that the two-second advantage. Thank you.